Happy New Year and welcome back to Bolas Talk. And I'm so excited because one of my good friends has decided to be with us today and her name is Amber Love. Everybody welcome Amber Love. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I just kind of want to give a brief introduction of how we met and then I'll let you take over from there. <laughs> oh God. Oh goodness. Okay. So we met at towards the fall of 2014 mm -hmm. when I was in LA and we did hair sport together in Sim Valley. Shout out Fred and Becky, the Ooh. choreographer and director. Um mm -hmm. And we met some really great people along the way. I played Lil Inez, you play one of the Dynamites, and we really formed a closeness and a friendship in the midst of that. And so I just want you to take it from here. <laughs> wow, what can I say? Uh, my love of theater, um, a lot of people don't know that I have a passion for theater. Um, and I love the whole process of theater. I love from the audition to everybody getting a number to communicating with so many different people. And I think we like connected right in the audition. And so um, <laughs> I was like, I just love her so much. Um, and we connected and then we started to do the show. And of course, my life is a little bit busy um, being a mom and then doing other stuff in production. So um you were just there so helpful keenan was there helpful the whole cast and I, just to see how the black community comes together when we're really thriving in the arts and different things of that nature so hairspray was really life-changing and um anytime i can be on stage uh <laughs> trying to dance or call myself trying to dance you was dancing. always a blessing girl yes you was dancing you was dancing so um, one of the things you said, which I want to kind of delve deeper into, is that you are a mother. So I want everyone to know you are a mother of two, you live in LA, and you are in the entertainment industry, not just as a writer or, or, or actress. You do a lot of other things. So can you share with us what that entails? Um, well, when I moved to LA, I think, oh my God, like 20, 2005, the first show I actually did was Dream Girls. And then I did Dream Girls, and I was I was pregnant. And I remember I was working at Curves. You remember Curves back in the day where you used to like work out? Okay. And I was pregnant, and I remember somebody saying like, "Hey, that lady over there is a uh, a talent agent. Her name was Shirley Wilson." And I said, "I said, hey, put me on, put me on." She was like, first had that baby, first had that baby." Well, child, I had the baby, and then I took some cheap headshot pictures, <laughs> and I booked my first Walmart commercial. Oh, wow. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I booked my first Walmart commercial, and then after that, I did Dove, um, a Dove campaign, and then um, just kind of continued down that li line, you know, and then I signed my first modeling contract with Forever 21 Plus Size, but I was... Um, I was like a one of the models where it's not featured like on the, the platform, but a catalog model. And so that was a blessing. I was like, I made it. Of course. Um, and then I started, that's so amazing. Well, I wanted to let everybody know you're from the Bay Area. So when you say you, you moved to LA in 20, 2005, I want everybody to know she's from the Bay. She's from the Bay. From the Bay. <laughs> I'm a Bay girl. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a Bay girl. And so, you know, all this change happened. And so, in a matter of time. And so, I was doing that. I continued doing my humanitarian work, which was working with the community, working with Black Infant Health, and um, helping women, as well as just serving the community. And so now that has become my main focus, and I've been blessed to get you know some rewards for that. But that's not my, I guess, first thing. You know now. Now it's just about helping the community, about bringing awareness about homelessness, about foster youth, about um, trying to have a healthier community for for us all, you know? Right. Because that's mm -hmm. what it is. the world is a community and we all have our roles and our niches within that community. Exactly. Right. And I think as people who are in the entertainment industry, we find that we're kind of like the mirror of what we would like our society to be like. 
right? Mm -hmm. Evolve into, yes, we have our problems. Yes, we have our issues. But through our performance, we sh we have empathy, compassion, love, forgiveness. And in that, people can get closer, right? Isn't that yeah. like how we view it in a way? Um, you, you've met this talent agent at Curves. She tells you, have this baby. And then she signs. So then how does your career progress in that way towards becoming a humanita humanitarian? Well, when I was living here in LA, I didn't under, I didn't know any of the benefits of um, that they have for women and children. And so, um, what people don't know is that I am a, a domestic violence survivor. Um, it wasn't a very rocky marriage, but at the same time, it was had good moments. And sometimes we hold on to those good moments, you know. Um, but when God releases you, just just let it go. And so when he released me from that, I began to make candles. And I've sought out to make candles for myself. Like, this is going to heal me. We're going to just have one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And then it turned out to be more so for everyone. And that was okay. And the more I started to see that and see the joy that it brought to people, I just continued to make candles. And then I started to meet young people that wanted to learn how to make candles. So then I started to teach like on this is how to make candles, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I landed the job with the Cub and that was working with homeless youth between the ages of 18 to 25. And then God sat in, he sat on me the his heart, if I can explain it in a more, I don't know, that sounds kind of like, ah, not sat on me, but he put the weight of his heart on me to have compassion mm. and to, to understand what compassion looks like for people who we didn't give birth to. Mm. And that grew and, and over the months and over the years have grown. And so that's where my humanitarian work has come in now is just to kind of give people just a glimpse of what compassion looks like, what God love look like, um, how we can support and help each other without being bruised and broken at the same time. Because, you know, when you're helping hurt people, you can get hurt. You know? <laughs> right. hurt people, hurt people. Right. Um, right. So the question is like, how can we help and still have boundaries and still not be hurt or triggered, you know? And so I think through my life, that's what I'm experiencing. I experienced so much sadness. Some people see me and they go, man, she's so happy. So, true. But in that same time, I, to have that kind of anointing, you experience a lot more sadness and a lot more trauma. And some people can handle it and some people can't. And I think I, I spend every moment of my life laughing more, um, trying to have fun, trying to see life as God will see life, you know? Right. I want to commend you. Um, I've said this before, but I say it here on the platform so people know. Oh you, my goodness! Because you 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 said it. You were dealing with domestic violence. People mm -hmm. don't know that while we were doing this show, you were still in that marriage and you were dealing with that at that time. And there were certain incidences um, that you that could have triggered you to go bananas and walked away from the show, but you mm -hmm. were able to keep what was happening to you personal from affecting your professional life. And I commend right. you for that. And I, I love you for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you did it. And, and and it wasn't until after we finished the show and me and you were doing a hike up somewhere. I forgot where it oh was. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> and you, you revealed that to me. And I, I was just blown away because mm -hmm. even in the midst of that, mm -hmm. you were talking about God's love and God's, ability to show you that you will get onto the other side of that journey yeah maybe you know because i know we're talking about film and stuff but just to give a little nugget that if, if anybody is in a, a a position where somebody is putting your life and your physical and your health online you know what i'm saying then it's okay to let it go you're going to be okay yeah. he always captures his children he he, he captures us he takes us and holds us in his hand and he makes a whole new life Mm -hmm. that's what he does but we have the trust first you know so when we don't trust we work out of fear right right mm -hmm. um so you're able to walk away from that situation and you make these candles so make a candles right yes. a beautiful scent but how did that really come about like besides the fact that you had come out of the situation you were you were 
taking your life and you were becoming a single mom and you were taking care of your two beautiful children and you decided I'm going to go and venture out and do this business besides all the other hats (laughs) that I already have. What Uh put you more into making those candles? Um... I guess for me, like I had a talk with, like I went outside and uh, I was yelling at God in the rain. And this is a true story, y'all. This is a true story, okay? I went outside. I put a seat for the Lord too, like he could, like he want to sit down with me, okay? So I put a seat outside. And I was like, "You sit here. You get the. High. I said, "You get the high chair since you sit high and look low." Yeah, I was really, I was really coming for God. And no lie, it was pouring down raining because I went back up north. It was pouring down raining. The sun came out. Like the clouds moved out of the way. And the sun came out. And he was like, do you question me? Like, am I not God? Did I not make, you know, the stars in the sky and the moon and and these things? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when he gave me that speech, I was like, wow. Like, yeah, you are. And you still choose to talk to me, you know? And so then I began to, I don't know, it was weird. It was like, um, I don't know, downloads. I got up, I put the chairs back, and then I went to Michael's. And I was like, I'm going to start making candles. Like, that's just how literally, it was like, I'm going to start making candles. And I started to, didn't know what wick was, what wax to get. (laughs) And as I started making candles, he began to give me scripture. And he began to say, you know, um, what's the scripture that says, you know, I'm the clay and was I'm the potter and you're the clay. Oh, you're the clay yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm the potter and you're the clay. And he began to show me how to make candles and I began to get better and better. And I started to feel better. Like I achieved something. Mm -hmm. And at the time I didn't have no money. And so I went down to a small cafe and I said, look, I can work. I can work for free. I said, I can organize, you know, I have my two kids with me. And the guy made me some cocoa and he said, you can have my job. I'm leaving tomorrow. And he gave me the job. And I cannot be, and I never made coffee before. And so I learned how to start making Italian coffee and all kinds of stuff. Girl, by the end of that time, I was the chef. I was a nighttime chef cooking at nighttime for the art people. And then the morning time I was making coffee and barista, barista. And the lady said, well, I can only pay you 230 some dollars, but those candles, you can sell them here in my shop and all the proceeds can go to you. So oh, then I said, oh, my God, let me start making more candles because I got better. So I started to you know, test them out and everything. And I started to make more and more candles and I would just sell them at the cafe. And I have pictures of me selling them at the cafe. And then that's when God was like, OK, it's time to come back to L.A. And then once I came back to L.A., I found a wax store and God was like, I don't want anybody else to teach you how to make candles but me. And Mm -hmm. so I've never taken a class or nothing. And so after that, I began to train myself and I began to learn how to vendor. And and, and it just kind of, you know, history is just the rest of the history. That's it. Right. Oh, wow. I know those those candles are the bomb. I've had them. They're amazing. Now you're getting ready to launch your website. So then everybody will be able to buy them from all over the state. Right. Yes. The states from New York where I am, you've shipped to me, to Cali, to Florida, to Texas, to wherever. So be on the lookout for that. We will put the link on this video so that everybody can purchase some. So easy. Like www.soulmakeovercandle.com. We didn't do candles because I think somebody already had that, but just www.soulmakeovercandles.com. I had a website before um, and then it kind of got washed away. And so now I was able to talk to a marketing person and she kind of helped me regroup just to start off small. And I just believe you just have to really start off at your pace because on one side I'm doing something and then on the other side I'm doing this. So like, I'm super excited to launch it and to feature the candle of the month. And I think that's how, you know, just a little bit by a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, revamping and, and growing at your own pace. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, Miss Amber Love, as an actress or a storyteller, I would say, mm-hmm. which film or which television show or which actress or which actor has been the most influential for you? Mm. 
like as far as like in the acting ability or just far as as a human being it could be both Ooh. or you can have one for that and then one for an, the human aspect so it's up to you because right now i think it would be between viola davis and denzel washington <laughs> Those are two very great choices. I do have some Caucasian actors that I love so dearly too. I really do. I really do. I don't discriminate because there's a well, there's this one Asian actor. I don't know if she's. I don't know what descendant of the Asian part she is, and I don't want to be disrespectful when it comes to the Asian culture. But um, she's always in the movies. She's inspiring too, and she's worked with every she's worked with angela bassett she's worked i don't know her name but i watch if she's in a film i'm watching it you talk about michelle Yao. yes i think it's certain whatever it is whatever she does i'm watching it yeah i'm watching it hands down yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. i think you're talking about michelle because they did that one movie where they were the librarians yes that one yes yes i know i know you would know you are you are definitely production nerd genius okay <laughs> All I have to say is one movie and Ashley got it. She got it, y'all. But I told everybody my secret power. Um, yeah, I think it's called Gun Gunpowder Milkshake. Yes, yes, and it has that. Yes, and they're like, but they're badasses, and they're like, I mean, but it doesn't matter. She can do Dungeon Dragon and Tiger Dragons, and I mean, and she's just so beautiful. And hey, girl. I want to meet you someday if you see this, but she's amazing. She's amazing. Anything yeah. she does, I'm watching. Yes. Right. right. Crouching tiger, hidden dragon. No, and, just the trap. <laughs> and now she just was on this Netflix thing called the origin bloods or <laughs> I was like, the origin. <laughs> Girl, like I'll tell you, I'm like, I love the mystical stuff, but I was like, I only watched it because I saw her in it and I was like, Oh, it's going to be dope. She's going to have some kind of sword fight. Some, you know, and it's, she's just, she does it so beautiful and she s resembles just wisdom. And so I'm just like, man, I, I love her. She's great. So Michelle, yeah, if you ever come across this, and Miss Amber Love and myself would love to meet <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah, I know. I, the first time I watched her in anything was the James Bond movie Tomorrow Never Dies, mm. and it was the first yeah. time that I had seen a woman who was not sexually objectified in a film. Wow! Mm -hmm. Like you could tell she, she came into the scene. Yes, she was sexy. She was beautiful. But like, it comes to a point where her and Pierce Brosnan, who was James Bond at the time, like. He realizes how good she is as a fighter, as mm -hmm. another agent in her own right, that he has yeah. to sort of rely on her a bit. He comes to rely yeah. on her towards the middle of the movie and towards the end because he's like, oh, she knows what she's doing. She the, she the bomb. Like, he had her walking into the meetings like, look, this is my culture. This is what I want to do. This is what I can do. Boom. Yeah. Give, it to her. give her the money. Yes, give her all. Anytime she walks into a room, don't ask questions. Just every studio just needs to give her the money that she's owed. Yes. I totally agree. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes. I totally agree. But you said you said Viola Davis and Mr. Denzel Washington. Now, what is your favorite film of both actor and actress, mm -hmm. and what about them as human beings that you admire and cherish so much? Wow. Okay. So I'll start with the lovely Viola Davis. Um, I just love watching her interviews. Uh, I, there's so many. There's so many others. You know, Ashley. It's Cicely Tyson. There's so many. I just want to just jump their names out there because they're Cicely amazing. Tyson as well. Yes, you named them. I mean, but I'll stick to Viola right now because she's mm -hmm. a lot. But Viola Davis. Um, the, I I would I don't even want to say woman king, but I admire her from for working out and getting herself together. But I love her in the help, mm -hmm. and I know she says something like. Um, 
that maybe that shouldn't have been a movie she should have done or maybe something like that. But I love her in The Help. I absolutely enjoyed her. I liked how she told those stories of the women. Right. And she told, she finally had the strength to share her own story. And when I saw, when I watched the movie, I just see my grandmother and I see mm-hmm. her mother. And I just see so many beautiful black women that weren't able to authentically share their stories about being the help and Viola and Octavia Davis just does it so beautifully. And when she has that last part, um, when she says to the woman, she goes, ain't you tired of being mad? Like, ain't you tired of being evil? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It like brought tears to my eyes. And then she just looked and realized the baby she had to leave behind. And then she just walks. Mm. she just walks you know what i'm saying and it's like oh like you, you know certain scenes that you just capture like ain't you tired of just being evil like ain't you tired mm. you know and she just paused she gave up her whole life whoever that woman's story she embodied gave up her whole life and she just tells it so well she tells mm. it so well yeah i think i think the reason why later on in her career uh, Ms. Viola Davis said that about the help mm-hmm. is because not for us. I think there was a certain people that wanted her to recreate that same performance in other films. And I think mm. that something within our industry that we're in the, I don't want to say in the fight, but it is yeah. a fight. It is yeah. a struggle because as time is progressing, we're, we, we're hopefully trying to create a path where we'll be able to say, and have more opportunities to say stories that we want to yeah. see. And I think um, her getting that role as the 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 maid, you know, right? I, I think she felt like certain people just felt like, oh, that's the only role she could do because that mm. was a worthy performance. So wow. she was getting scripts just for that. Okay, you know, and it's like yeah. okay. See me in something else. See me in something new. And I think for her, she had to fight that, which is why I think mm. she came across. Um, I think that's why she stepped away from movies a little bit and did the show. You is important. You is smart. You is kind. You is important. Yeah. I th- I think sometimes uh we can't we can't pinpoint our calling. Mm. Sometimes sometimes God wants us and our ancestors are like tell that story. Mm. I need you to tell that story. You know what I'm saying? And we may think like I don't want to do this or why should I have to keep getting these stories, whatever? Because maybe you've chosen to tell the story. Mm. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I would watch her in the help over and over again as a black woman gaining more strength than to watch her on how to get away with murder. So I'm in her and in, in seeing her in the help, it just really showed me a part of history that we don't ever want to forget, you know? Right. Right. But at the same time, I can totally understand being typecasted into one thing and you're like yo i'm more than enough but god always works it out girl because you see she now a woman king priesthood look fighting warriors <laughs> you know i think i think that's it's a very interesting thing because a perspective mm-hmm. because i think what people don't i think for me as a creative and who is also a believer i think i'm always in that internal conflict of god has created me in a unique way so i think outside the box i think right because i'm so aware of my identity in christ but others who may Mm -hmm. not necessarily be believers they kind of try to pigeonhole you to a particular idea of what they think you are and you get into these situations and circumstances where there is a there's going to be some friction and some conflict right. as a result of that. And I think I think my question to you would be where where do you come to that place where you say, okay, I'm gonna let you have this for a little bit of time, <laughs> get used to it, but then mm-hmm. you gotta really understand this is who I really am. Mm-hmm. 
And like, because I feel like we give people the grace to grow, right? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. discover new levels of who they are as experienced. Like people who necessarily may not be comfortable with people of color, we're very welcoming, community-driven people. So we'll welcome you. We'll give you the space to get used to us. We'll give you the space to learn from us. Mm -hmm. How do we... How do we teach them to reciprocate that type of behavior and attitude? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. I think um, it's 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 difficult for other cultures, um, in a particular culture, mm-hmm. it can be difficult because they have to really transform their mind mm. to. And be not sympathetic, overly sympathetic, but just the fact of being like, I may not understand, but sit with me and 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 give them and give the it's another culture the freedom to do it. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like you know it best. Let me not control you. Right, right. You you do it. And whatever funding, if it's a good story, whatever funding it is, will will help them make it happen. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I don't know, sometimes they tell our stories a little bit better than we tell our stories. So I can't get mad at that. You know, like, I mean, like when we think about Steven Spielberg, like nobody would ever dare make the book, The Color Purple. Mm. And he made it and he made it so amazingly beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Um, From the culture to the traditions to everything. So I don't know is really weird it really depends on the hands that is put in mm. you know mm. what i'm saying um who to say if i give you one of my stories but you won't turn it into something amazingly beautiful you right. know whether if i put it in the hands of this person i'll be like what did you just do to my story and so you could be white and i'm you know indian you know what i'm saying but you told my story wonderful right 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 so i just really I really it really depends on the hand i believe we all need to be at the table of we course. all need to be at the table. Yeah. Yeah. We all need to be at the table saying, this is cool. Um, this is what's in. This is not cool. You know? And I think when you have so many different aspects of it, then that's what makes a beautiful story. Mm. Mm. You know? Right. Right. So you saying that we all need to be at the table. Now, this is another question. I recently did. I recently was at a film festival the, over the summer. And one of the things that they were saying was that... Um, there is not enough programs or opportunities for people of color to come up in certain departments mm-hmm. and uh, groups within the entertainment industry. Like one of the things was cinematography and how people make black people look, people of color look on s- screen, on film. Yeah. And sometimes they'll look ashy, sometimes they'll look dark. And I, I'm not gonna, should I say? <laughs> I'm gonna just say I'm gonna just say Robin Thede from Black Lady Sketch Show was one of the presenters okay. and I'm not gonna say the name of who or whatever but she said that that was an encounter she had when mm. she was shooting the first season of a Black Lady Sketch Show was that when she was in the editing room with a particular cinematographer who was supposed to be like top of his game and mm. like you know and she was like, everybody look ashy. Everybody just look dry, mm-hmm. you know? And she had to call HBO and be like, it's this, I, this, this, this guy is not, you know, doing what he needs to do. And the only reason why she did it was when she tried to tell him, like, can you make us look brighter? Can you make us look more lively on screen? On screen, his response was, this is the best I can do. Mm-mm. And so that was her, that response made her go to him and be like, I can never work with this dude. Wow. Like, yeah, I need to find me somebody who can make us look good. And so they found the cinematographer, I believe the guy who does Blackish, he okay. was available and they got him to do Black Lady Sketch Show. And then now look at where Black Lady Sketch Show is today. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. And so just that, wanting that, pers- that idea of, but we need to have more people in the pipeline like we need to have those that are good at their craft 
But mm-hmm. I think the famous actor John John Lemon Lemon or Lennon. I can't Lennon. remember. Lennon. Lennon. Mm-hmm. Lennon is the actor John Lennon mm-hmm. um, from Odd Couple and all those movies, um, the apartment and stuff. He used to say, "Bring the elevator back down." Mm. So, like, you may be good at what you do, but if you're not teaching people underneath you, or I shouldn't say underneath you, younger than you, who is not as experienced as you, your craft, then we're building this gap Mm -hmm. of those that can fill in the role. Because at the end of the day, we have to be real with ourselves. (laughs) You know, we're not going to live forever. We're not going to be in this space or have this opportunity for, for for such a long time. So when you say this, we need to be at the table. Do you think the reason why a lot of us are 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 trying to get those moments, but are, it feels like we're getting blocked from getting to the table. Mm. Um, how do we handle that? How do we create those opportunities where people are willing to bring us to the table? And wow! Listen. Yeah, and that's really, and listen. <laughs> I know. Oh my God! I think. Um, I think it's a, a dynamic of both. Um, I think one, we are being blocked from the table. Then at the same time, once we get to the table, we're being compromised at the table. Mm. Or we're not bringing our authentic selves to the table. Mm. Um, or we are bringing our authentic selves to the table and then they go, okay, fired. And you're like, you just, you didn't even give me a month, you know? Right, right. I remember, and I'll tell this quick story. I remember I was working on um, Jumanji 2. Mm-hmm. And I was working with the line producer. And this I think current, I just, this is the current Jumanji. This is not the Robin Williams. Yeah, the, this was the rock production. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and I was working with the line producer. And um, and I think I only got in there because I think he maybe thought I was attractive or something. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, all right, I'm bringing Amber on. And I was in a room with all white people. Mm-hmm. I was the only black person. And it was this one girl, she was Israeli or something, you know? And so I remembered um, the man says, why is she here? Mm-hmm. Like, to me, like asking me, why was I here? And he had to tell him, he was like, because I want her here. She's my production coordinator for the you know, for this whatever thing that we were doing. So I had to make sure I was on P's and Q's. Nobody talked to me. The hairdressers, people didn't talk to me. Um, And I noticed that they were treating the extras wrong. Mm. So of course, I'm a champion for extras because I've been an extra. And I'm like, yo, you bringing these people here and they're here longer than you've asked them to be. And they'd be like, so what? Well, you know, no, add an additional... $20 $20 to that $50 that you were going to give them. You know what I'm saying? So they were like, all right, all right. So I had to champion for the extra. So now one already, I'm a problem starter. Mm. But you're really not because you are, a, you are a champion for people and you exactly. come to that place. Know that you're not supposed to mistreat people, but they took it and switched it. Okay. One, I'm, yeah, she's a problem st- a starter, you know? So then two, after that happened, the girl, the Israeli girl, <laughs> I hope I'm not offending nobody, but she had a tantrum. I mean, in front of the extras, throwing chairs and oh, like, I can't believe this. And da, 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 da. She could have a tantrum, but I couldn't. But you didn't even have a tantrum. You just I went to the I didn't even have a tantrum. So I, t- I sat out with my line producer. I'm like, well, I just want you to know this and this and this is in order. And then, um, and also, too, to let you know that, you know, he said, what happened with the tantrum, the such and such girl? I said, well, she just had a little tantrum and kind of three chairs. And he was like, all right, but I just make sure you're on top of it. You need to be da 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 And I was like. It's okay for her to just have this tantrum. It was okay for her to have a tantrum. But I'm the problem. Yes. She had been for more money. Like, literally, you had these extras here. You told them five o'clock. It's two in the morning. Give them an, and you have them in the cold, waving, doing some stuff. Give them some extra money. Come on now. Come on. You know? Um, So I think just in Hollywood in general, it's just people very inconsiderate. It's very, you know, inconsiderate. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that's why I stepped aside from it because seeing it from an actor point of view and a production point of view, I'm like, there is no compassion. There's no compassion. It's just money. It's just money. It's not saying, hey, I'm grooming somebody for it to be the next Denzel, the next, uh, you know, Ava DuVernay. Like, I'm not, I'm not grooming anybody to do it. I just want this money, and I want to. We got to get it done. It's a deadline. Mm. You know. So my thing is, what do you do when you're at the table? You know, so once you get in, you're at the table with the producer and they're looking at you like, okay, well, congrats. You made it in. Now sell your soul. I'm not doing that. Mm. I'm not Mm. doing that. You know, or what we now as black people, which is changing what we think used to, what we think is funny. is not funny. Mm. You know, we're, we're, us as a people are not even authentic anymore. Wow. We have been so watered down by real, um, Real lives of whatever, Hollywood, Atlanta, whatever, whatever. We've been so watered down by reality TV that mm. we have taken the whole authenticity of who we are as creators, as people. And um, so I think once you do get to the table, who are you? Mm. Who are you when you get to the table? Mm. Well, I can say this. I can vouch because I was background when I lived in L.A. for the first season of How to Get Away with Murder. And I can say this. It's probably the one time and I've been a background on a few shows that the extras were treated beautifully. I mean, Mm -hmm. from my perspective, Miss Viola made sure that all the extras had food, Mm. that they ate well that everybody was treated good we weren't sitting out in the sun looking crazy because no it was none of those things another show that i think was really good and it's probably because the person is just genuinely nice um morris chestnut Mm, hello he (laughs) He did a show in miami i cannot remember the title i think it was like fox something i can't remember it now foxwood or fox house something and he was he would come and eat with the extras in the morning dark outside and he would come he was he's such a nice Person. I, I went to church with Morris Chestnut, and he was <laughs> <laughs> why we're lovely people. See, look at that, and so mm-hmm. them having that kind of like we're gonna make sure, right? You know that presence, and they understood because they've been there. They didn't let right. it's that thing where people say you can't forget where you came from. Mm-hmm. But you can't bring the things that you used to do with you on this new journey, right? And I think that's the question is like, when you get to the table, who are you? Mm. Who are you? You know, what What I worked on was a very, it was a short, it was very fast. It had to be done in less than a week. So it was a, it was a turnaround really fast. And it, we were on a strict budget and it was very a short production team. So that on the other, that explains that aspect of that. But when you talk to like, as far as like being at the table and being able to make those decisions, it's like, wh- who are you when you get to the table? Do you want to really tell our stories? Mm. Because if that's the case, I would love to see a film person come down to a shelter and sit and listen to real stories of real young people and people that go through daily life and then go back to your own personal life and go, man, I'm so blessed. Mm. And then go, how can I now be my true authentic self to to share a humanitarian story? Right. And bring laughter. Like Martin, that was genius. You know what I'm saying? A guy falling in love with a girl and they live in an apartment and he's trying to make himself known. You know what I'm saying? And that's genius. And it's funny. It's good writing. Living single. It's true. It's about four black women, you know, um, trying to find who they are in their career. That's life. Life is not supposed to be overly thought of or overly complicated. You know what I'm saying? It is the simplest stories. But when mm. you try and come in and you're making it like, okay, let's uh, formulate that. You know, it's like, well, okay, that's cool. That's great. You know, but it's very simple, very simple. Mm-hmm. Very simple stories to share. People are usually just regular people that want to live some crazy extraordinary adventures here here and there and then you have some people that just really like to be a waitress and they've done it for 25 years and that is what they want to do right right so i mean i don't know so that's all my thing is like when you get to the table who are you Mm. who are you that's a good one that's a good question Mm -hmm. 
question. Who are you? And you won't know until you get to the table. You won't know until you get to the table. And if you're just as crazy, guess what? You create your own table. Right. You create your own table, just like Issa Rae created her own table. Right. And, um, and then that got sold to a network to where she can be the boss of her own table and bring in who she wants to bring in or whatever, you know? Right. We are, we are so creative. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's okay to be at the table too. Like at the same time, it's okay to be at the table as long as you're being free to be able to be um, expressive and tell real stories at the table. I can't watch a lot of TV now because I'm like, it doesn't reflect to me. Like, what does this got to do? Either, either, either it's over sexualized or it's over, you know, greedy or greed. I'm like, these are not everybody's story. But this also what I say too, not every black person like, I know there's snowball and there's power. Not every black person in the hood does drugs. There's some that want to go to colleges. There's some that goes to high school. You know, that's what made love and basketball great because they, it was in a beautiful, they lived in a beautiful neighborhood. The dad worked at a bank. The mom was a homework, homemaker. There's black people, yes, that stay at home with their children. And that is fine too. Not every black person want to be be in excellence all the time. Their excellence is about maintaining their home and their children with their husband. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's black excellence. Black excellence, the weight of the word black excellence to me now is like, oh, oh my gosh. Can't me every day getting up in the morning. <laughs> I, think that word, I think the word should mean different things to different people because it mm -hmm. depends on where, where your walk is, right? Where you're going through in your life. So black excellence could mean being a home a homemaker, a, a wife, um, a, and a mother to your children that you know that you're going to prepare for the world. Right. But these are stories, once again, like if I could sit at the table, I would tell these stories. There are some funny stories to be a stay-at-home mom. You got the mocha moms. You got so many, you know, moms. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I would be sitting there listening to all the different stories that other moms would tell. Like, these are stories of everyday life that people would watch, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Make them just a little bit funny. So, yeah. I mean, that's what make the Cosby's great. Because it was a story. Of, he was a doctor. She was a lawyer. And they still had time for their children. It was like, they're insane. Yeah. That? And now well, people are probably do. Yeah. Claire Huxley was still coming home after working a nine to five at a law firm and make dinner for her family and had everybody sitting at the table. Mm hmm Realistically wise, I don't know. But, but at the same time, it was good, clean TV that we can watch and we can use our imagination mm. to say, that's what I want. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what I want. Um, Cause it, it told a story, but it left a hole. Like what's your part? Mm. If you were part of the Cosby's, who would you be? Got it. You know, and then you, like when we think about Hillman, like when people, you know, they say, we want to go to Black House, you want to go to Hillman. What was Listen, I did not know what an HBCU was until I saw A Different World. And then I was like, oh. Exactly. It's a whole different world. I was like, I want to marry Dwayne. And I went ask. <laughs> and my husband does look like Dwayne. But anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, he but, does. Yeah. My husband did look like him. Yeah. He did look like Dwayne. But that's what I thought. I was just like, and at the strength of Dwayne, like, man, like how. He didn't check with me, but he was like, yo, look, you're not going to disrespect me as a man, like, in that way. That's strict to me. But he didn't hurt her or nothing. He's like, no, you're not going to disrespect me, and I won't disrespect you. And and it just, it, once again, it was an underlined, uh, outlined story of where do Amber fit in? Where would Ashley fit in? Mm. So Ashley could say, you know what, I see myself as, you know, Cree. You know what I'm saying? The wild hair and fun and explore. And then you be who you are. But that's what it did. It just created imagination. But when you have stories, it's like over sexualized and over this and that. You're like, okay, well, I'm trying to. Um, so why are we not? I just feel like we're not giving our our children's generation the same opportunity to have an imagination. Mm. We just go, this is a story. Dump it on you. You figure it out. Mm. You a druggie. You a hoey. You a what? Would you? What are you? Like, hey, I'm a smart teen. 
and that's coming from perspective as a mother because you're you're your mother too and you you govern what your kids watch and are allowed to watch so it's hard for you to find shows that you feel comfortable as a family unit to watch yeah my son tells me all the time like why you don't watch this no more it's like oh just it's too much going on or why you don't watch because it's not it's, he doesn't see himself but he'll watch keenan and kale all that from the from the 90s because they're all day and watch it because it leaves the mind to an imagination of you can do anything you right. can do anything you can use your imagination and it's funny and it's fun and it's innocent mm -hmm. and that's what kids at this point need right now just innocent mm -hmm. that's it we're pushing too much on them too fast too much on them too fast too much to where they're like, oh, I want to explore this, or I want to try this, or I want, you know, and it's like, well, who put that imagination in your head? And right. we all know it's the work of the enemy, but it's just kind of like, pull back, pull back, you know, and, and I just reserve back to the question, like, who are you? You're at the table. You trying to fit in, you trying to, who are you when you're at the table? I mean, that's why the classics, I think, are still so relevant today, because you know, even in, I'm like, there's moments when I'm like, I just want to feel happy. And I'm like, I'm going to go watch Hey Arnold or, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Or like, uh -huh. go watch, like my cousin has a, a, a two-year-old and I was like, we're going to watch the shows I watched growing up. So here's some Reading Rainbow, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I was like, and to watch it, I'm like, yo, Reading Rainbow was so educational. Mm -hmm. So Reading Rainbow, so girl, look, I be still singing the theme song. Everybody still do, you know. Butterflies in the sky. I can go twice as high. It's in a book. Take <laughs> and I'll say, and I used to go to the libraries. I'm like, do you have this book? Mm -hmm. Like I'm serious. Like, do you have this book or do you have that? Um, I, I love stuff like Jim and how they would go through the struggles and then they touch their earrings and then they transform like Jim. Like I love this stuff, and I'm just kind of like, just keep it simple, man. Keep it simple. So if you, if you were coming to the table, what story would you pitch to me? Oh, Ashley, girl, you know what? I actually had a story, and I totally forgot what it was. <laughs> I put you on the spot. <laughs> um, you know what? If I can tell a story, it would be maybe the younger version of Living Single. Mm. Mm -hmm. It would be... Um, that would be a nice, like, reboot. <laughs> like, the high school... High school version, yeah. High school, middle, not middle school, because there's a lot of middle school stuff. I think it would be high school because I used to teach theater for middle school and high school and so when you're in high school you're not necessarily an, an adult um you're not necessarily a kid and it's so difficult to still make friends you know what i'm saying but i think if you had those different friends that was like max and khadija and you know what i'm saying and all the regina like the friends and they're in high school Sinclair, <laughs> yeah you that, know what i'm saying mm -hmm. that, that would, would be dope, dope. <laughs> that would be dope. That and they would kept be it going through life like hey you like that boy this boy they go to school they go to different schools and they kind of explore you know what i'm saying be like whoa who's that um you see them trying to uh but it's their day-to-day -day kind of life that they go through together maybe my, one parent is divorced you know what i'm saying and they kind of have that sisterly bond like you know here you can come over sleep over here you know what i'm saying and you know i can just have highs and lows in life you know yeah and kind of like how they kind of weave into like where we see them as the adults that they become in living exactly singer. like can you and imagine this, younger max that'd be awesome that would be, be awesome, awesome. and in that awesome. like even with that it would be clean like you would not i don't even want it to be a speck of oh i'm struggling with my sexuality and, and for anybody who is probably uh, this is no offense like but it's just i don't want to even have no any sexuality in it any the only far it would get would be like man he kissed me what you know what i'm saying 
um or if telling stories like okay they showed up and there was drugs there you know what i'm saying okay how did they navigate that situation as friends um just showing different blocks in life and they're doing it together as friends mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying um so yeah i would definitely do a revamp it would be like living single high school that would be dope i would i would watch that for sure I would watch that. <laughs> and it, it would be a comedy of it, would, it would it would be a comedy like it wouldn't you know but it would have those moments where i don't know what you would call that like a dramatic comedy or something like that but nothing it wouldn't be a dark comedy you know now this is one of my favorite questions because i feel like if i were ever asked this question i have so many like <laughs> so many stories that i would choose as a believer mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you could choose, if if I was a producer and I was like, I'm giving you, how much do they give Ryan Coogler? $250 million to shoot any Bible story. Uh huh. Which one would it be? And who would you cast in the titular role? Mm. To do a story. Any Bible story. I I'm giving you two hundred and fifty million dollars. Oh, I got one. I got one. Okay. Okay. I would tell the story about Jonah, and the reason why I would tell the story about Jonah is because he reminds me of all of us. Okay. Mm. So for your viewers out there, for anybody who listens to this, Jonah went out. God gave Jonah a word. So imagine it's it would be a comedy too. It would be a comedy, but serious at some point. Imagine you sitting there and you're like praying to God, and He actually talks to you. Like, mm. Jonah, get up. And I need you to give blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, man. Now imagine a skinny kid with an afro. like. Oh. And of course, God is the voice of Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones. If you have that Morgan Freeman, the epic voice, God. Um, and so Jonah gets up. He finally hears the voice of the Lord. And he's like, oh, I'm going to do what? You want to go do what? And God is like, go tell these people that I'm about to kill them. Right? Mm. <laughs> So Jonah's like, all right, I'm, I'm, he pulled himself by he's working out. <laughs> Let me go live weight. But then at the same time, he's like, wait, I'm about to tell these people they're going to die. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. So like, no, God, I'm so sorry. So make a long story short, he's walking out to the water. He runs from God's word. Mm. He runs from God's word. Now you finally get a word. You sit on a tree, you finally get a word, whatever. He runs from God's word. He gets on a boat. He tells people on the boat, he's like, look, as he's giving them token, I'm running away from God. So, <laughs> and of course, you're a captain. You're like, ah, oh, get on the boat. You know what I'm saying? He gets on the boat. He's knocked out sleep. And all of a sudden, a storm comes, like, you know? And everybody's like, hey, who, who disrupted God? Did you disrupt God? Did you disrupt God? Remind you, they're not believers. They serve another God, you know, or, you know, different stuff. So they're thinking like, who disrupted this, whatever this is? And they're pulling strings. So imagine, you know, it ain't your God. It ain't your God. And it's like, yo, there's this dude who actually said he was running away from God. Go wake him up. Read the Bible, y'all, okay? They wake him up. And he's like, yeah, I told you, I was running away from, it's, it's, it's the God I serve. He handles all the water and the sky. Like, he's really powerful. And they're like, what? He's like, look, if you want him to stop this, just throw me off the boat. They're like, nah, nah, we ain't about to kill this man. No, nah, we're not going to kill him. Make peace with your God. He's like, nah, man, he want me to do something. I'm running away. They're like, no, no, no. He, he's like, just throw me over the boat. They throw him over the boat. And as soon as they threw him over the boat, the wind and everything stopped. And they thought, wow, this is a powerful God. And they begin to believe in God. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Somebody's mistake. And then they begin to believe. So anyway, all of a sudden, Jonah's thrown over the boat. The a giant whale comes, eat him up. Swallow him whole. So I mean, swallow him up. So Jonah chilling in the in the whale, like, man, we got seaweed around his throat. Like, just imagine. <laughs> the visual, the visual. Oh, he's a skinny kid with you know seaweed, and then he after like the dead the second day, he's like, man, this, this guy's breath stinking. He starts to cry, and he's like, God, look, whatever you want me to do, I surrender. I'm sorry, I, you know, I'll get it right. Oh, father, you know. And then the third day, go black. Guess where he gets spit at? Right at needles, right where he need to be. <laughs> you can't make this up. 
And so he like looking at God, looking at the well, the well wink at him, like, look, you know. So he goes there, he's yelling, he's screaming, he's telling everybody, the Lord's gonna destroy you. Oh, get yourself together. And he didn't think they were actually going to obey. Right. So the king goes, get rid of anything that is not of God. And let's surrender and let's fast and let's, you know, all this, y'all read the Bible. Let's fast and let's do this. And they all repent. You would think Jonah would be happy, right? So Jonah go, I'm about to go to the mountain and sit under this tree and, and just <laughs> and watch God destroy the city. God be like, nah, I'm not going to destroy the city, Jonah. <laughs> and and Jonah's mad. He is mad at God. He's like, oh my God, I knew you were going to do this. You are a merciful God. You know these people are evil. You brought me all the way out here to warn them and now you want to have mercy on them. He was mad. That joke was so mad at God. So then what God did as a joke, as Jonah was sitting there mad, he made a little leaf. And a little leaf grew and gave Jonah shade, okay? And Jonah was like, God, I'm waiting for you to destroy it. And so God was like, okay, you still want to be mad. So then the next day, God sent the worm. The worm ate the leaf. And Jonah is like, well, then what you going to give me a whole thing? And you know what he says to Jonah? He said, you're mad that I gave you a leaf and that I sent a worm to eat the leaf, right? You're mad at that. And you had no part in that. You had no part in that. So why are you mad that I saved almost 1,200 people or mad that I saved a whole city when that's something you had no part in? Mm. You were just a messenger. So you're going to be mad either way. And you never hear about Jonah ever again. Mm -mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you never hear about him. But that was the question. God was like, why are you mad? Did you create the leaf to grow over your head for shade? No. Yeah. But you're mad because the worm came and ate it. So why are you mad that I literally just saved a whole town? I would do a movie out of that. That'd be dope. That'd be dope. She know, but nobody ever talks about that story. <laughs> Listen, I remember gro growing up, vacation Bible school. That used to be one of the go-to stories to tell, because like, it was showing you like this is the disobedience. When you don't listen to God, you get swallowed by a whale, and you got chill in the whale for three. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's how they they stop there. They stop right there. They don't they give you right the outcome. Yeah. yeah. You notice that they never go further than him eating in the whale, and then him getting spit out and landing at Nineveh, and then it's that is like it yeah. didn't is right there. It never talks about the fact of him warning people. He get mad with God, how God created the leave, how God takes away the leave, and then tells him and that was the most powerful part of the story. It was like, why are you mad? You mad that I'm? I literally saved the whole town, mm. and you had no part in that, right? listening to you say it, I was like, oh, wow. The perspective that came into my head was like, that journey was not just for the people of Nivea, Nin Nivea. It was also for Jonah because it was trying mm -hmm. to, sh he, God was trying to show Jonah that like disobedience, not just disobedience, but like you thought that the people were not ready to hear me, but mm -hmm. in actuality, it was you. It was you. Mm -hmm. Who wasn't willing to do what I needed you to do for these people. Mm -hmm. And also, too, to show that even in our disobedience, God still gets the glory. Right. Because even though he, in his disobedience to run and flee, he got on a boat. And it says the men were so intrigued by the, the storm and who God was so proud that they began to believe and right. worship. Do you see what I'm saying? He's thrown over the boat now. And right. they're like, God, we thank you. So, I mean, yeah, even in our disobedience, when we say no, we go left, God still, he still is like, I'm going to still get the victory. Right. And even in the midst of that, the grace, and, the same grace and mercy that God had for Jonah didn't let him get chewed up by the whale and let him to get himself spit back up is the same grace and mercy he provided for the people of the city. Mm -hmm. And Jonah was too mad to notice that. Too mad to notice that. He saved him from the boat. He saved him from the whale. <laughs> he gave him shade. And that's why God was like, you, why are you mad? You, you had no part right. in none of this. You had no part in none of this. Wow. That's like parallel life, though. Like, we ask God for one thing, and then we're like, but God, that's not enough. 
You need more. Like, God, I need a job. Okay, I give you a job, but what are you doing as a result of the job? Mm-hmm. How are you how are you managing the job that I give you? Are you being a good steward of your life with this job? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, that is what and that's why when you talk about jobs, you need to pray. God, send me to the right job. Mm-hmm. Send me because when we go to every job. It's an it's not only an answer prayer to you, but it's also an answer prayer to them. Right. And so now when I go to jobs, you know, it's easier for me to leave because now I'm like, oh, okay, my assignment here is over. You know, or I'm like, oh man, I, I some people you get really attached to and you're like, man, but then God says it's go, it's time to go. Oh, my assignment here is over now. You know, I like what I'm doing to, at this point, but if God says it's time to go tomorrow, then I have to. All right. He never stirs me, like never ever stirs me in the wrong direction. Right, right, right. It feels like it. <laughs> so place, I'm like, man, we supposed to set our roots here. I was like, no, 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 no. Mm-mm. Man. No. Mm-hmm. man. So Ms. Amber Love for 2023, where do you see yourself as a as a mother? as a creative, as a candle, businesswoman. Um, you had you had your podcast too. Yeah, I did have podcasts. That was good, like over 5,000. Listen, this was before podcasts were like podcasts. Mm. I think uh, 2023, um, I think I'm going to just kind of, I don't know. I have no goals. I know that sounds bad. I know. Like if you if you're a goal person, make goals. Um, because every time I make a goal, I'm always disappointed because God laughs. He's like, I got I want you to be over here. And you thought this is it. So That's I was it. like, God, I know. I'm like, I'm done. God has the biggest sense of humor. I think it's the mm-hmm. funniest thing. Like you say, God, this is what I want to do. And God's like, eh, I'm about to show you who's in control of the situation. Mm-hmm. And it goes entirely left. And you were like, I am not prepared for this, Laura. (laughs) I've never, I look, I'm going to tell you something. I wasn't prepared to be in the front line of TMZ. Like I, I wasn't prepared to be on the top. Like I I was not prepared for a a lot of things in 2022. And I was just like, whoa. And what I, I think what a lot of people don't understand is when I go through so many amazing things, I go through them by myself. Mm. These these powerful moments are solely alone. And Will Smith said it, he said it best. He said the most successful person, whether it's heart, spirit, whatever, is on it's like a lonely island. Mm. You know? Um, so that and that's what makes me kind of fearful because I'm like, oh man, the more you get, the more the island becomes lonely. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. and so in that case, I guess my goal is to really embrace embrace destiny, embrace um, loving people more at where they're at, embrace uh, myself, forgive myself, you know what I'm saying? And um, creative-wise, the only thing God had asked me or released me for at this moment was to do the website. And and that is just to show myself to invest in me. You know what I'm saying? And if people order candles online, they can. That's why I said it's going to be very small and so I can grow, grow it. Um, but at this point, I just kind of stand still. And mm-hmm. so like beautiful people like yourself come along and say, hey, I want to create something, a platform for women, for men, for theater heads, for production gurus to come and speak their mind i'm like yo i'm i'm there you know we're at the and table this is the table this is the table well this is the thing <laughs> i was so back and forth with this youtube channel because mm-hmm. i i don't like i'm gonna be quite honest with everybody i am not a big social media person i am not a tiktok person i'm not any of those things and i feel like this industry is moving more and more towards that direction and I said, I don't care how many likes I get, how many views I get, mm-hmm. how many followers I get. I just wanted to create a, a place that um, people could come, people could give their perspective. Because being a creative is not necessarily being at the award shows. Mm-hmm. You're at the Oscars, you're at the Golden Globes. There's people always working. 
you know, and there's in, in order for you to watch those television shows or watch those films, there has to be people that are doing the makeup, people creating those costumes, pe people that are creating the writing the words that these people are saying. There's the person that says and cut. There's a person that has to get the person the coffee. There's the person who's making the food for the people to have on set. And I wanted mm -hmm. to create a place that we you get people could see these people and know who yeah. they are and recognize them and have that room for them to give them the the gratitude and the thanks and the acknowledgement that they deserve because it is a uns a true ensemble of mm -hmm. theater or or film or television is everybody that comes to the table and it's not just the actors mm -hmm. and, the director and that's it it's the producers it's the writers it's lighting it's grip it's, it's a community it's the extras it's a community and that's mm -hmm. i think that's why i love being a creative because i can go into a space and create a space where everybody no matter the color creed background language they speak we can come together and we can have fun and play right mm -hmm. and we can just vibe off each other and so that was why i did this youtube channel because i wanted some place that we could all come and be like this is my favorite show and or this is what I want to talk about today. Like us, we were impromptu. This was not something that we planned. It was just like, <laughs> let's just go with wh however this conversation goes. And so thank you, Miss Amber Love. I love you and I appreciate you. <laughs> well, thank you. Look, like I said, you know, when God puts it on your heart, you know, it's like fire. And yeah. you just do it. You just do it. You just don't know where it goes. You know what I'm saying? And you just give thanks and you, you throw it out there. Like I tell you, I be like, look, I I do my candles. I'm like, I get five or six likes. I'm like, oh, yeah, keep moving. You know, I've always got a whole new different post. I'm like, oh, today I'm here. You know, I, I don't wait. <laughs> I have time. Mm. We are, we are, we are on, on time. You know what I'm saying? We're on borrowed time. We're yeah. on borrowed time. Yeah. I, especially now more than I feel like every day, another great role model passes. Mm -hmm. You know, like we were on a call with the ladies when we were doing our thing. I got off a call and I'm like, Barbara Walters passed. Yeah, what? I saw that. And I was man. like, man, mm -hmm. you only get a certain, uh, a certain time to be young, a certain time to, that's why I'm a champion for young people. I'm like, let them be young. They only get a certain time where they got to pay taxes and do all this other stuff. And, you know, um, and you get time to be so great and be so strong, you know? So when I go to different jobs or do different things, I'm like, man, I'm on my, I'm on time. You're on my time. So what are we getting out of this? I, I worked at a radio station, well-known radio station. And I'll tell you the story real quick. And the, I've done so many jobs, y'all. It's crazy. Uh, you are uh, Jan Janet of all trades. Okay, Janet I, of I all trades. I done music videos. I done worked at an airport, drove a truck with all men at the airport. I done had so many jobs. But anyway, I was at the radio station and it was crazy because the lady says, I changed my hair. So I didn't, I look different. I look black now. So she was like, whoa, you know, I had a fro. And we know how that is when you're working in corporate and your sister and you change your hair to a fro. And they'd be like, well, who are you today? Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Sidetrack, we need to support the Crown, um, Crown Act. For that kind of, and that is very important. Very, muy importante. Muy okay. importante. Um, okay. Yeah, because how you wear your hair is it shouldn't be your choice, just like anything else. It should be your choice how you wear your hair. So anyway, so there was this radio station in LA, and she goes to me. She goes, um, "You know, you're just stubborn and and all this other stuff like that." And I said, "Okay, you know, well, what did I do wrong?" You know, and she's like, "I don't know, I don't know." Just me being, you know, had the fro, which really, but she didn't want to say that. And she goes, you know, I said, well, I'm sorry. And she goes, you know, you have 90 days with the company. You have 90 days with the company. And I said, yeah, wait, 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 wait. You just, how did I change my hair? Slow down. This is, this is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, you see how the accent is coming out, the Caribbean accent coming out. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. So, you were, you just, the first time you just happened, to wear a fro to work, you decide to not wear locks. You don't decide to wear your till no braids, and you come. I discovered my 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 Scout <laughs> breathe, and this person said you're being stubborn, and then they give you ninety day notice. Yeah, 
Yeah. Wow. And, and, and what she didn't know, if she had asked me because of the stress in my life, my hair was falling out. Mm. Uh huh. Because I mean, now I'm so thankful with the hair I have. And, but because of the stress in my life, my hair was falling out. So I had, you know, the ex at the time shaved my head. And I was very insecure about it because I was like, oh my God, you know, I have real pretty hairs. So I'm like, oh my God. So I wore a head wrap. And the one time I felt a little confident to wear the fro, she was like, I don't know. She just made a whole, like, you know how they bring you in and want to have a meeting. and uh, So, yeah, please support the Crown Act. I mean, so she brought me. So this one, she said, she says, so you got 90 days, right? And I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? Dang it. And the only thing I think was I cut my hair. And I looked at her and I said, and so do you. Mm, you are bold said, like that. I am very bold. I'm crazy bold. I was like, you have 90 days, too. And she goes, <gasps> I said, mm -hmm. 90 days to see if I can get along with you, 90 days to see if you're workable, and 90 days to see if we're compatible. She goes, you know, you got a soft head and a something soft ass, I don't know, something like that or whatever. And I mean, maybe about a week later, she had me do some really strenuous heavy lifting work, and um, and I got it done. And then she had me do something else. I got it all done. And then she brought me in and she goes, this is your last check. Let me tell you the crazy thing. A friend of mine's at the time had literally, I think a year ago or almost two years ago, had a boutique opening. That lady that had fired me at the station was there. And guess what? Because this was a black lady that did this to me. That's why I said, who are you when you're at the table? Who what? are you when you're at the table? The whole time it was a the whole time you're saying this, I was thinking it was. Oh, I don't know. She was black. Yes. Oh, Who are you when you get to the table? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's what made it more. That's what made I don't want to say more, but that's what made it disappointing. That can and hurt. at the time when she had that, she had straight hair. She had very bone straight hair and everything. I see her at a friend's opening, mm. and her hair is natural. The irony, the irony, and something. But this is this is God. I was so happy and so filled with who I am. I didn't even notice her until I stepped back, and I was like, "I know you from somewhere." And she knew she knew me. And she was like, "Oh." And when she left, I literally thought, "That's that chick that fired me." Because of my hair. Oh my God. So I was so filled so with just who I am and okay with who I am. Right. But I didn't see her because it was natural. And I was, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, you touched on something there the insecurity that someone has mm -hmm. and how she projected onto somebody else because for whatever reason mm -hmm. and then look at a couple years later grand opening of a friends event and here you she's wearing her hair natural, natural hair that is and you but that but that's the and i just asked that question it doesn't matter what table you are whether it's production or broadcasting or rate whatever model whatever because i've been in a situation where i've had models say why is she here she's short and girl i still ran that runway you know what I'm saying? But it's like, who are you when you get to the table? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Instead of her saying, you know what, sister, I love your hair. You know, you know we're in corporate though. So if you want to do a wrap or you want to wear it, I got your back. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. But instead, she chose right to give you a hard time. She chose to give you a hard time. And, and then it got confirmed. Through her assistant, because I later saw her assistant through a friend, and she was. I said that lady gave me such hard. She said she did. We had a meeting about it, and then turn around. It's the same woman. About a year or two later. <laughs> wow, that's a story right there. That's a story. So now I understand. We said when you get to the table, who are you? Who are you? How are you, mm -hmm. you going to behave? How are you yeah. going to? Be yeah. how you react. How you, what? How's your attitude gonna be? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And you can also touch on the point of how you treat people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, how you treat people is what's going to either help you down the line or it's going to hurt you down the line. Yes. yes. And and also, too, as black women, and I just express it's okay to take criticism a little bit. Mm. We don't have to be on a thin, so dang sensitive. You know what I'm saying? My boss is Latina, and she sat me to the side. And she said, "You need to ever start speaking up for yourself." And I thought, I was in myself, I was about to be like, "Say it," you know. But when she said it, I was like, "I, I receive that." I didn't be like, "Oh, she go, I'm about to quit," and that, you know what I'm saying? Like, who, who? Okay. But this because you know? she saw something in you, she values you, and she knows you can bring something to the table. That's why she said, "Speak up for yourself," because she can mm-hmm. trust you. To handle things that certain maybe other people that she works with like this person's not gonna do it. But I know if I tell Anne for love, she right. gonna be- just not taking things personal. Um, you know, like I said with the with the uh, the lady, you didn't know she was a sister until I said she was a sister because and when I realized how she was treating me, that's when she said, You got nine days, and instead of me going, ah, ah, you know, I said, and so do you. Mm. you got nine days too. Mm. Ninety days from how to figure out how you're going to treat me. It wasn't, you know what I'm saying? So it is just, it, it's certain things just when we get to the table. Who are we? Man. Who are we? <laughs> when we get to the table, who are we? If who that's we? not something to think about for 2023, I don't know yeah. what it is. That's a good one, Miss Amber Love. Yep. Yep. So I, 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 you know, like I said, I realized I, I can get crazy wild at the table. So guess what? I, I'm one of them that need to make my table over here. Because <laughs> I'm not changing my hair. I ain't changing my personality. There are things I can work on, definitely. And that is why I stay in the game of the work first. Because I'm, it's okay for somebody to say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should get better at this. And I can say, okay. Or I can say, mm, I'm not going to. I don't think so. Or I can say, you know, but you're always being, you know, there's always somebody watching you where you can better. Do you see what I'm saying? And then I take that and then I do my business and I go, this is how I want to do my business. And I'll take that little nugget that I learned there and I go, okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, that's yeah. some good stuff there, Miss Amber Love. <laughs> Girl, like change purpose. Change purpose. And it'll chase you. Well, I want to tell you what, I I need to end this on a good note. And I want to tell you that you taught me not only as a person and a creative, um, but a believer that we have to love people despite themselves. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Amber Love loves. Um, (laughs) You know, um, loving people past their foolishness. Mm-hmm. Loving people past their insecurities, loving yeah. people even though sometimes they don't know how to love you the right way, mm-hmm. you know, and having that patience. And I've, from our friendship, I've been able to take that, and that's how I move in the world now. You know, ever since that mm-hmm. time, of you, you learning, like you were the one that was like, "This is your prefer- first performance. Give yourself grace to fail. This mm-hmm. is your first theater show." in front of a big audience like this, like give yourself the room to fail. When when no one really else is besides Keenan, you know, mm-hmm. like you two provided a safe space for me to grow as an artist. And I appreciate you for that. I really oh, do. Um, to this, let's you. Say, you, and die, you, you and Keenan, right? At, no matter where you are in the world, if y'all call me, I am there because... Uh, you provided this safe space for me to grow. And I felt no judgment from either of y'all. I didn't feel like, you know, I had to watch my P's and Q's around you two. It was definitely something that I, it's probably why those are the two relationships that I've kept with the most out of everybody from that, that cast and crew, not because anybody else was, you know, less than or anything. It was just a, at that yeah. period and point of my life, you two were the two that really were consistent, you know, yeah. and you guys have always been consistent. Like when Keenan's in town, I see Keenan. When I'm in LA, I see, you know what I mean? Like, yes, I love when I see my Ashley. 
<laughs> you know, and so that's why, you know, and I love your kids, Nini and Kai. Yay! You know, shout out to mm -hmm. them. They're brilliant. I love great I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you because you're so precious. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Like I know I, I got tons of stories. So I'm gonna tell you this story. I was blessed to perform uh in front of Eartha Kitt. Oh wow. So she passed away. Yes. Okay. But let me tell you, I was in college. Shout outs to HBCU. And this is, and also to take this too, to know that it's okay. Like you're going to be okay and everything will be okay. I got there. I was so stressed because I was working a, a graveyard ship at IHOP. And I didn't know I got into, you know, they were like, oh, audition for this HBCU, whatever. And it's going to be at Spellman. And so I was like, oh man, I'm not even a vocal thing so i go in there and you know my roommate she's a vocal thing she helps me with all the the, the music i get in there I audition the guy says all right will you leave here like you never auditioned for disney before so i said all right so you know because i wasn't used to like auditioning blah, blah, blah. make a long story short they accepted me in the program but i get there to the program down in atlanta and i lose my voice yeah <gasps> I can't. I'm like, oh. no voice. I'm drinking lemon and tea, and I'm like pl praying to God, like vocal God, like please give my voice back. No voice. And while I'm there, you have to do training. You have to do intense dancing, intense acting, and you know, because you've studied um, dancing, acting, singing. You know, and so I can do the singing part. So I had to do the dance part. Couldn't really do the acting part because I didn't have a voice. So it was the night of. And this one song I've been working. And the guy says, well, what song? The one original song that I wanted to do was I'm Changing from, uh, from Color Purple. And instead, I sang Standing in Your Grace. It was called Grace. And this, the words were, how could someone like you? And to remind you, Eartha, Qu Eartha Kid is in the audience. How could someone like you love someone like me? full of disgrace and so many insecurities. But when you look into my eyes, tell me, what do you see? You know, that make you love me so. And it was just, it was just a beautiful song. And afterwards, Eartha Kid came up to me and she signed my thing and she said, thank you. And I thought, God, this whole time, this whole week, I had no voice. I think it magically popped up. Oh man, Eartha Kid, the voice. The, yep, Eartha Kid. And I just will never. You know, Eartha Kid, Catwoman, Eartha Kid. Wow. She came to the rehearsals and everything. And she did the, her legs lifted up and stuff. And all the guys were saying, say Marcus. And she was like, Marcus. Marcus, <laughs> darling. Hey, how you, how you doing, Lady Eloise? <laughs> it was the best time but at the same time we live we learn we fail we come back stronger mm -hmm. and that is what it's all about well look at that we live we fail we learn we fail mm -hmm. we come back stronger we come back stronger and that's it. Words to live by. Thank you so much, Miss Amber Love. We appreciate you. We are, you know, the invitation is always open for you to come back anytime, you know, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on a panel. I'm trying to do this panel. I want to do a panel on a particular show. Um, yes, panel. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes in the next couple of weeks and months. But thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, thank you, and Ashley. I, I love you. I appreciate you. And I hope everyone enjoys it. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.